This is African American History's American History. Welcome. I'm your host, Harlan Kearsley. This program's goal is to foster understanding, promote discussion, and expand knowledge through the stories of historical events, bios of unsung heroes, as well as timely and relevant news stories, which, hopefully, will paint a vivid picture of the effect segregation, discrimination, and bigotry had and continues to have on the lives of both blacks and whites. Comparisons will be made between the many racially fractured periods of American history and what's going on right now. Slavery was abolished 150 years ago. Jim Crow, only 50 years ago. Yet stop and frisk, voter ID, stand your ground, income inequality, and a host of other current problems are proof that their detrimental effects continue to be felt and that the struggle for equal rights for all must continue. Oral history is the gathering of living people's first-person testimony of their own life experiences. Now, we all have stories to tell. You live long enough, you'll have volumes. So I was appointed, and that's a matter of record, by the way. The first Negro appointed in Manhattan. That was June 28, 1911. I was sworn into the New York City Police Department. On March 6th, 1911. I'll never forget that day. Never. That's Samuel Jesse Battle. He's just one of many African Americans who've made major contributions to this country and yet have become largely forgotten with the passage of time. Early in his career, Officer Battle was regularly pointed out by tour guides as New York's first colored policeman. The day I was appointed, there was no problem. But as I left headquarters, the commissioner himself stopped me. Officer Battle, I'd like to have a word with you. Yes, sir. I won't keep you, Battle. I, I just wanted to talk to you and tell you personally how very proud I am that you're, you're a New York City policeman. Thank you, sir. That's very kind of you to say so. Not at all, not at all. I I'm sure that there are more than a few people around here that are very glad that you're here. Uh, no. I hope you know that there will be some, uh, uh, some difficulties at first. But I know you'll overcome them. I'll do my best, sir. Glad to hear it. But, but if any problems do arise, feel free to bring them to my attention. Yes, sir. All right. Now, I've kept you long enough. Go home, Officer Battle. Go home and celebrate. <laughs> Samuel Jesse Battle was born... January 16, 1883, in New Bern, North Carolina, to parents who were among the last generation born into slavery. Everything about Samuel was big. He had big hopes, big dreams. Why, even his very birth was big. Because at 16 pounds, Samuel quickly became noticeable in New Bern, earning the title of the biggest baby ever recorded in the state of North Carolina. But it was as a teenager that his need for bigger thrills got the better of him. One day, he was caught stealing cash from a safe belonging to his boss, a prominent landlord named R.H. Smith. Now, Smith wanted to press charges, claiming, Mark my words, within a year, that young man will be in prison. And he might well have been, if it hadn't been for the fact that R.H. Smith was a friend of Samuel's father, a Methodist minister, who managed to talk him out of locking up his son. In a 1960 interview with Samuel Battle, conducted by the Columbia University Oral History Office, just six years before he died, Battle exclaimed, That was the turning point of my life. I said to my father, from this day on, I shall always be honest and honorable. And I'm going to make Mr. Smith out a liar. <laughs> On June 28, 1911, the six foot three inch, 285 pound, 28 year old made good on his promise. 
Samuel Battle becomes the very first black person appointed to the New York City Police Force. In 1926, he would go on to become the first black sergeant. In 1935, the first black lieutenant. And in 1941, New York City's first black parole commissioner. I moved to New York from North Carolina in 1901. I was hired as a houseboy at the Sagamore Hotel on Lake George, which didn't admit blacks or Jews. From there, I became a $32 a month red cap at Grand Central Terminal. And for most of my career, I lived in Harlem. Now, all in Berlin, 1910, all of 8th Avenue was Irish, and 7th Avenue was a mixture of Irish and Jewish, 137th Street to 140th Street. Any place below 133rd Street was Irish, German, and Italian. One thing I will never forget, the Irish boys on 8th Avenue wouldn't let the other races come on 8th Avenue at all. It was forbidden ground to them. Come on, move out the way. Oh, oh now there he is. There he is. <laughs> the Negro Patrol. <laughs> but I was expecting to see you looking all spiffy in your new uniform. It's not the same. Did them white folks get rid of you already? <laughs> Morris Riley. For some reason, we never got along. Maybe because I got the job he was after. And he knew better than to call me Sam. I hated being called Sam. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry who shines shoes, washes dishes, carries bags in the lack, they used to call him Sam. Mars didn't realize it, but he had just reminded me of why I needed to move on and up. This is African American History's American History. Now, I'm sure it goes without saying that being the first black anything presents a great deal of challenges. And being the only black police officer in what was, at that time, a 10,000-member force couldn't have been easy. Now, when I went to training school, I didn't run into any discrimination. They were all rookies like myself. But after the 30-day training period, I was assigned to a precinct, landed in West 68th Street, and things really began to perk up. I thought I would be received like I had been at the training school, but no. Not one patrolman would even say hello to me. I got the silent treatment. One day, I found a threatening note on my bunk. The note was filled with a few choice racial epithets and a hole the width of a bullet. I remember thinking about what the commissioner said about my running into difficulties, but I wasn't about to go to him and complain. I challenged my colleagues that had something against me to be a man and meet me in the cellar and take it out on my black behind. Nobody did. My superior officers were extremely nice to me, though. Big, thick Irishmen. They were supposed to be tough, but they were very nice to me. Of course, I did my duty, and I was careful. I tried to help other policemen, my brother officers, and to be nice to them and not make any trouble. I was living then at 27 West 136th Street. Now... During those early years, it was a transition period. Whites to Negroes. There were houses where Italian, Jewish, and Irish lived, but they'd let colored people in if they paid more money. Still, the places were deteriorating because they didn't make the money that they had been making. A lot of people got wealthy as a result. I saw the transition. Battle's first assignment as a patrolman was in the San Juan Hill neighborhood. 
For those of you familiar with New York City, it's where Lincoln Center is today. Even before Harlem, San Juan Hill was one of the first African-American neighborhoods in Manhattan. When the African-American population eventually shifted uptown, he was reassigned to Harlem. The West 68th Street Precinct took in 59th Street to 86th Streets, Central Park West to the river. That was the San Juan Hill area. Just west of Amsterdam Avenue was mostly Negro. East of Amsterdam Avenue was generally Irish. South of 65th Street, it was a mixture, but generally Irish. The Negroes lived, as I say, on the west side and down the hill from Amsterdam Avenue. There is still a hill there now. When you get up on level ground on the east side of Amsterdam Avenue, it's level ground. So San Juan Hill was named that in connection with a battle in the Spanish-American War, so that when these Negroes came onto the west side, they dubbed it San Juan Hill because they used to come up the hill after the whites. They had riots, many riots. There were riots in 1911 to 1912 when I was working there. I was on reserve one particular night. We had wagons to carry us to transport us to places when on reserve, but this was so nearby I didn't wait. I dressed quickly and was running down Amsterdam Avenue. I was in training and a good runner and going fast. When I passed the firehouse, I heard a fireman say, Hey, look, boys, there goes Babel. He's in the lead. <laughs> <laughs> I went on down, and we got there with my squad. The whites and Negroes were battling. I saw the white cops beating up the colored people, and I thought, here's my chance to get even with them. I saw them whipping black heads, and I was whipping white heads. I'll never forget that. We quelled it. We didn't make many arrests because in those days you didn't have to. Today you'd be forced to arrest a lot of people to prevent them from taking civil action. What was the cause? Just interracial conflicts. They sometimes start a fight over a crap game or anything. Just some little thing like that. One will start a fight and then they'll all get together and you'd have a riot as a result. The result was that this didn't happen anymore. Then in 1913, when I was transferred to Harlem, I found that, of course, the white officers worked in an all-Negro neighborhood, practically. And they needed me as much as I needed them, and sometimes more because some of them were on posts where they were all Negroes. This story had gone out that he's a decent fella, and they began to treat me nicely and spoke to me and asked me to join their organizations and things of that kind. There has been a wealth of historical information gained from the interviews conducted with people who participated in or observed past events. Now, these narratives from seemingly everyday people must be preserved, whether through audio tapes, videotapes, or written works, because if they're not, one day they will simply disappear forever, and future generations will be the losers. What a difference a century makes. Today, African Americans make up close to 25% of New York City's population and 18% of all police officers. Black, Hispanic, and Asian New Yorkers make up almost 48% among all ranks. Despite aggressive efforts in places like Central Harlem and the Bronx, recruitment of African Americans in the NYPD continues to decline. Now, there are many explanations for this decline, Everything from demographic shifts in the city's black population to the department's over-the-top stop-and-frisk tactics, which have done nothing but sow even more fear and distrust of the police in minority neighborhoods. And the recent chokehold homicide of 43-year-old Eric Garner by Staten Island police officers has only helped to cement those feelings. This is African American History's American History.
I'm Harlan Kearsley. On behalf of everyone here at African American History's American History, thank you for listening. And remember, none of us can truly embrace the future until we first confront the past. African American History's American History is copyrighted H.C. Kearsley, 2014.